Welcome to the third presentation of day one of the series of seminars on tourism development, developing heritage and nature tourism in the Humber Head Levels and the Ancombe Valley. The theme of this presentation is an introduction to tourism issues in rural areas. So, we know that tourism can have a huge impact on people, on landscape and on the economy. And the question is really, why do we not make more use of it? Um, and what might we do to trigger more of the benefits? In other words, you know, what can we do to raise um, awareness of the, the sleeping green giant? We can learn by looking beyond our own region and our own specific areas and sites to a region such as Southwest England, Devon and Cornwall, where tourism is a huge driver for the economy, for social issues, for well-being, and for biodiversity. And think about um, well-known tourism attractions, such as the Eden Project and the Lost Gardens of Heligan. And we will touch on some of this in the second day as well. So can we awaken the sleeping green giant. What we do know is that tourism facilities, attractions, can generate huge economic benefits. This is Carsington Water in North Derbyshire. It's one of the largest water impoundment reservoirs in the country. And it's a huge hub for tourism, leisure and countryside recreation something well over 500 businesses badge themselves with relation to their proximity to this particular site and it's a day visit attraction it's a local attraction and it's a tourism attraction it's surrounded now by farms with caravan and camping facilities by pubs hotels restaurants uh, and much more leisure centers spas health centers so it's a real hub. It's also a dynamic hub for local biodiversity. And it is also part of uh, delivery of major infrastructure, in other words, water supply. So summary, leisure and tourism are widely recognized as major economic drivers. They are forces for change in the environment, in society and the economy. As with all such major components of de development, they need careful planning, implementation and monitoring. But they're increasingly developed and supported through strategies and similar documents. And an attraction like uh, Carsington Water will trigger the recovery and will support hotels, pubs, restaurants, etc. And through that, there's potential also to support the farming industry directly through provision of things like B&Bs, holiday cottages, etc., but also through producing local produce to then supply into the food chain through the same pubs, restaurants, hotels. So there's huge potential here. And the question really is why do we not make more of it? A big issue for um, countryside recreation and leisure and tourism in the countryside is the importance of the, what I hate as a term, the green infrastructure. In the Humber levels and in Ancombe, for example, the networks of trails, of footpaths, of canal sides, et cetera, et cetera. And these are generally free to use at the point of using. Um, and that can be great for the visitor. It may be difficult for those who provide these resources. And we need to look about at that in the round and think of cleverer ways that we can support those, be it local landowners, farmers, or local authorities who provide this infrastructure that we take for granted. So a strategic context. Considering tourism in relation to life and economy, it is important to place it within a framework for analysis and debate if we're going to emerge with any sort of coherent vision of ways forward. It's useful to consider both rural tourism 
and countryside recreation, including day visitors, and to consider these within a single policy or strategy document. That's often not the case. So day visitors can be part of countryside recreation and countryside recreation can be embedded in rural tourism because visitors come and they recreate in the countryside. However, day visitors are often local day visitors and therefore not tourists. So again, we need to think about how we manage the provision and the support um, in a more coherent way. Don't assume that this is the way it's done because it often, it should be, but it often isn't. Tourism and sustainable development. We need to think about what sustainable development means. And we generally go back to the Brundtland 1987 definition. And that is development that may, meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, I do have a problem with this. It's, it's been the ground base of uh, discussions on sustainability for 30 years or so. However, there are some big problems with that definition because it is totally anthropocentric. It's, it's human related. It's meeting our needs without compromising the needs of our future generations. It doesn't really say much about nature and us being part of nature and us depending on nature and therefore us needing to manage nature sustainably. So I think we need to be a little bit careful about the deeper meanings of sustainable development. It's clearly relationships between tourism and sustainable development, and these are especially important. Relationships between nature and tourism are not always direct or obvious. Generally, there are links to heritage tourism, which are more widely recognised of visiting a great cathedral, a castle, a grand landscape and uh, Georgian house, for example. So that's an obvious connection to heritage and the built environment. With nature, it's often less obvious. But because of this, there's a consequent lack of positive action to safeguard or conserve the resource base. And we often uh, lose both heritage and nature in a, a blithe way without uh, thinking about the long-term impacts, not just because it's a good thing to do to conserve nature and heritage, but the actual real economic disadvantage that brings. It's increasingly clear that all tourism is to an extent dependent on environmental and social sustainability. And I remember discussing, when I started doing research on tourism many, many years ago, discussing with leading um, academics on sustainable tourism, asking what they thought they were sustaining, and they kind of looked blank and didn't really have an answer. They didn't necessarily see their tourism embedded in nature and they didn't really understand the natural resource, the nature of the ecology as it were. Some tourism is fully and actively embedded within the core concept of sustainable development, some is peripheral. There are some key issues. Don't assume there are necessarily many good examples of integrated and joined up approaches. Many strategies for tourism, leisure and countryside recreation, or recent development in nature or heritage conservation are actually there, but they're very fragmented. They're not integrated. And that's a big, big disadvantage to all of them. Because through triggering appropriate leisure, recreation and tourism, we can link into food production, local provenance, local distinctiveness and nature conservation and distinctive uh, landscape, et cetera, et cetera. We can bring much greater benefit to bear if we do this more cleverly and more holistically. Now, a long-standing example of good practice would be the National Trust. They pioneered uh, economic assessment processes in Cumbria, for example, where they are a major landowner. And what they showed was how you could own the land, you could own the farms with tenant farmers, you own and maintain the natural resource, but you also provide the products of the countryside, the foods, the drinks 
to supply into the shops, the cafes, the restaurants, and even the pubs, and many of those being owned by the National Trust as well, and with people employed by the National Trust. So you're kind of squaring the circle from the tourism footprint to the delivery of the natural resource on the ground, the infrastructure that's essential, and the tourism economic spend. This is not always the case. For organisations like the National Trust for Indian Heritage, it may well be, and they have members like the Wildlife Trust and the RSBB have members who themselves pay, and that money helps support the infrastructure, the facilities, the sites, the staffing. But very often you have heritage and landscape and nature that is free to view. But what that also then means is that the local authority that has to pay for the wider maintenance of that resource does not receive the funding. So you end up with a bizarre situation such as in Whitby, where you have thousands and thousands of visitors year round now, unlike uh, traditional seaside resorts which have gone into a decline and often almost empty in winter, Whitby is not. Whitby is thriving. But all the basic facilities, such as toilets, as basic as that for a family visiting can be quite important, you have to pay. And it's quite expensive and you need cash. Lots of people don't carry cash now. So for a family, that's, that's a real inconvenience. Yet these people are bringing millions and millions of pounds into that economy, and yet we fail to provide even the most basic of facilities. Now we know that there's a potential tourism to support and trigger local economic recovery, especially in rural and coastal areas. There's a potential wildlife and heritage tourism measure to enhance and support an evolving or emerging tourism industry. There are matters of issues and potential. Now I would say there are two big issues. The first is that many tourism and other recreational activities don't directly support or facilitate the management of the wider landscape in which they take place. The footpaths, the gates, the styles, the signage, the interpretation. So they're not actually paying for what they're using. And yet this landscape is often critical to be there being attractive to visit. So local farmers, and I understand that farmers can gain extra money for higher level stewardship payments by providing public access. But it is a horribly bureaucratic process, and that puts many farmers and landowners off. So the tourist or the visitor, the recreation visitor, the leisure visitor, expects to use this countryside free of charge. And yet the farmer is expected to provide it, maintain it, enhance it, etc. And that is clearly not a sustainable approach. Most tourism doesn't bear the financial cost of managing the resource that it consumes. The benefits of visitors are often not based with the same organisations or the same people that bear those costs. And for rural economies, there is a big difference between modern tourism and more traditional rural economic activities. Second issue, much tourism, and tourism researchers often don't like to admit this, much tourism is both fickle, i.e. unreliable, and seasonal. As I said earlier, if you go to a, a typical English seaside holiday resort in winter, you will often find not a single light on in the evening. It's closed down. It's become a, a summer holiday dormitory. That is a big, big problem, because if you have that, you actually lose a lot of the services because they are not year-round sustainable. You lose the local community who would provide the hospitality and the service support for those visitors. So this is a problem for a rural economy in need of stability, reliability and predictability. Leisure, tourism and recreational activities can support and aid rural regeneration, making vital services viable. So even small numbers of recreational tourist visitors can maybe keep the village shop open, the post office open, the pub open, the cafe, 
etc. So we can actually make a local community much more sustainable by simply increasing that visitor footprint. And best of all, if you can spread that visitor impact year round. However, and we need to be very careful about this and clear about this, tourism does not replace or supplant more traditional rural economies. There are links perhaps to core resource management, wildlife, forest, heritage, etc. But sometimes those are not direct because we're not paying to visit. So we need to think about how we support that resource management through critical transfer of tax revenues. That's not a politically favoured approach in our present environment, our present social environment. But it is the answer to managing this so that we don't kill the goose that's laying the golden egg. Tourism is relevant to environmental, social and economic sustainability. And nature is important to tourism. And we range from green tourism to nature-based tourism to sustainable tourism and ecotourism. We need to be careful with the latter, and we will touch on this in a, uh, a later presentation, because what is often called ecotourism is not ecotourism. Ecotourism is about take only photographs, leave only footprints. In other words, you're having almost no impact. As soon as you have impact on local people, local economies, etc., then you are changing them, and it is not then pure ecotourism. And lots of things which are actually wildlife tourism are badged as ecotourism, and they're not. It doesn't mean they're bad, but they're not ecotourism as defined. And there are some places, such as China in particular, where mass tourism to heritage or wildlife viewing is viewed as ecotourism. And it is not. It is mass tourism. And in many cases, it's actually very damaging. So there may be weak links from these into mass tourism. And you need to be aware of the differences between these different niches, if you like. And mass tourism is often a lot of money, but with relatively low amounts per person. Whereas what we're looking at with some of the other tourism approaches is maybe fewer people than mass tourism, but high spend, high end visitors. And with that in mind, we need to look at economic and environmental impacts of recreational activities because these vary through tourism to recreation day visits and local visit impacts. The tourist is the high end spend and the local visitors are the lower end spend. It doesn't mean they're not important. Indeed, if you have a, a week tourism base today, that might be grown over time from a potentially strong day visitor profile. And day visitors are the easier low-hanging fruit. So if you can build that up, that's easier, it's more reliable, requires less investment and is less risky. And that might enable you to improve your weak tourism base, so grow that to a, a stronger tourism base. It may not, it may be that your location remains as a day visitor destination, that's fine. But walkers, horse riders, cyclists, they all have an impact. They all potentially spend money. They bring money into the local economy, be they local visitors, day visitors, or tourists. The facilities, resources, and infrastructure can grow over time with a gradual gearing up of activities across a region. And many of the resources are actually in the landscape, the natural resources, often managed by organizations in the Humber Levels Partnership, for example, and often free to visit at the point of the experience. So nature-based attractions and attractions may be especially helpful in growing the tourism base, growing the footfall, growing the countryside recreation visiting. And we need to look about at forging links between natural resources and tourism economic activity. You need opportunities to spend. You need to be able to get money off the tourism visitor and get it into the local economy. 
So we need to convert businesses to local spend. That requires infrastructure. That means we need to invest, and perhaps in a major way. The more we invest, though, the more risky it becomes. So there are risks, and there are issues of understanding basic economics processes. And my experience is that quite often people don't understand um, some of the issues that they need to be cognizant of. It's relatively easy as well to draw down significant grant aid for capital investment to purchase land or to develop a visitor facility for a nature reserve, for example. And I love this. This was Sherwood Visitor Centre. It's now gone. Um, it was it was so enough. It was wonderful. This is late seventies, early eighties. The Robin Hood Visitor Centre and the old Heritage Shoppy. And I've taken people from all over the world around here, and they loved it. It was a bit tacky. It was off its time, but it was a, a wonderful experience. It's notoriously difficult, however, to cover revenue costs, to get money and put it back into supporting the uh, infrastructure. Now, there's a good example here, which I've written about elsewhere as a case study, Carsington Water. And I mentioned that earlier. So a million visitors a year from the first year it opened. And it starts off as a twinkle in the eye with a water empowerment reservoir that nobody wanted, nobody in the region wanted it to happen. All the local visit, um, villages and towns were against it. Uh, and it was built. And at some point, someone suggested that, well, if we've got a big reservoir, we'll at least have a boating facility and a bit of bird watching. And then I've never found out who, or I've never found out when, a decision was made to switch that from a very basic provision, which will be fishing, boating, birding, to an all singing, all dancing visitor facility with shops, toilets, uh, cafes, restaurants, interpretation, education facilities, and a range of those. So that provided the huge car parking facility and uh, bus access and all sorts of things. It provided a huge and successful visitor attraction, a tourism hub. And it generates money through the car park, through the visitor spend, et cetera, et cetera. It also pays for the basic infrastructure because it is a critical water supply uh, facility. So that's already paying for itself. And to some extent, the rest is icing on the cake. Where it fails, and I have discussed this with the managers at Carsington, but they don't really um, respond to it, was that they have a range of service, which is great. It deals with visitors. It deals with people coming to birdwatch or to canoe or to boat and things like that. What it doesn't do, which a local authority range of service would do, is it doesn't engage with the local community. It doesn't go into schools, it doesn't go into community centres, it doesn't go into the villages, it doesn't actually uh, interface with those people. And today, as we are dealing with issues of important issues of health and well-being in relation to uh, contact with nature, then that starts to become more and more important. And that is a big difference between a private sector range service and a public sector range service. So there are still some shortfalls in that provision. The impacts on economic viability of projects goes from private sector businesses right the way across to conservation charities. So you need to be thinking, how do you raise the revenue to pay for what you've built? And that can be a problem because people often over egg the cake when they're looking at their economic projections and then they may have a problem or there may be a downturn in the economy there may be a bad summer um, or petrol prices might make travel prohibitively expensive and you have to have an answer to those because these will be the make or break scenarios for what you're trying to develop so if your region is not fully established in the tourism market, then you need to carefully assess the visitor base of local and day visitors. A facility, an attraction, or an area may remain a sustainable destination for local and day visitors without the leap to fully fledged tourists. And people sometimes say, oh, that's um, not very positive. Well, actually, 
in many cases, it may be appropriate. If you can't make the leap, don't do it. Don't jump. And not only that, a sustainable local and day visitor attraction managed effectively and carefully can be as important for the local economy as tourists. So it's actually not as significant as you might think. You're lowering your costs, but you're also lowering the, you know, you may be lowering the income, but you may be lowering the cost and the risk. And the reason is that retaining inward spend in an area or a region can be as effective as pulling in external money. So if local people are traveling a shorter distance, causing less carbon pollution, causing less uh, expenditure on oil and gas, etc., then you may be retaining spend within your area. Now, again, you have to be careful when you look at figures that are produced for local and regional economies, because they are uh, carved up into regions across the country. So, for example, I remember discussing with the Regional Development Agency and regional tourism leaders about the importance of visitors from, say, Sheffield or Rotherham to the Yorkshire coast. And they said, oh, it doesn't count because it's in the same economic area, so they don't count as tourists. And I was just thinking, oh, yeah, if I'm a business, if I'm a cafe owner, a restaurant owner, a pub owner, then I don't mind where you've come from. I just want you to spend your money. I want the footfall. So it doesn't matter that football, football, footfall is from southern England or from Sheffield. It's still someone coming in and spending money. So again, you have to be careful in, with some of the interpretation of some of the figures that we see in our given. And I argued very strongly with colleagues in the tourism sector um, about the importance of the natural resource, nature, as part of tourism and as part of regional economies. And, you know, canoeists there on the sea or on a river or on a lake can be very important and high spending. Look at those birders there with their optical equipment. They are spending a lot of money on equipment. They're spending a lot of money on outdoor coding and field guides and possibly tour guides. And they're bringing money into the national economy and they're bringing money into the regional and local economies. And yet the classic view of the tourism researchers is that birders don't spend anything. They come with a flask and a sandwich. And that is really not the case. And the anglers, I don't fish, I'm not interested, but I realise it's a huge economic force, both on the coastline and uh, inland, and can be something that in a, a wetland area like the Humber Levels can be developed and is, is developed by private enterprise uh, for competitive fishing and fishing holidays. And that, again, brings a huge amount of spend because you've got kit, you've got the gear that all those people have got. So not only are they coming there, maybe staying overnight or for a weekend or for a week, but they're actually spending a lot of money. And the other thing that we're singularly bad at, particularly where the tourism economy is not well established or strong, is actually collaborating between different tourism sectors. So you need to think about, well, what do people want as their experience? What's going to attract them in the first place? What's your unique selling point? But also what's going to bring them back? What's going to make them stop overnight? What's going to make them come back on as a repeat visit? What's going to make them come back as a, a weekend or a week long stay? And what would a family group or another, another social group want? You know, one of them might want to go fishing, one might want to go bird watching, one might want to go and visit historic houses or churches or cathedrals or go horse riding or golfing. So you need to think about these potentials in the round. Also often forgotten for a region and important for somewhere like the Humber Levels in particular, and possibly parts of the Anco, where there are large hotels nearby and good transport infrastructure, is the potential of business tourism. It's very, very lucrative. So if you've got a hotel in a nice location with a good infrastructure and a golf course nearby, then you will get business tourism. And that can then trigger return visits if people like what they see. And if we get the marketing right, we need to be clever about what we're doing, about making the links between the natural resources and heritage resources and the visitors. So we need to think about developing relationships between countryside tourism and recreation strategies and wider tourism growth. 
and I actually harness the benefit more effectively. It's important to bring these different aspects together into a coherent strategic vision and process. And we singularly fail to do that, both across the humble levels and throughout the Ancone Valley. It is not coordinated, it is not joined up, it is not maximizing the benefit. So we need, again, to think about relationships between countryside tourism and recreation strategies and regional planning and development. There are two-way interactions with the planning and economic development processes. There are implications for overall planning and development, positive or negative for tourism, and impacts of the tourism industry, which affect regional planning. We need to look for more integrated approaches. I remember talking to people involved in green tourism in the humble levels many, many years ago, and I'm sure it's still the same, if not worse. And they were saying, we want to bring tourists in, but we can't, we can't navigate the planning process to develop the B&B &B or the holiday cottage or the caravan park on our farm. We haven't got the time, we haven't got the skill, we haven't got the energy, and the whole process is totally user unfriendly. So we need to think about that. And it's best to integrate development planning and tourism planning processes as closely as possible. Otherwise, you can be pulling in opposite directions and you may accidentally damage tourism potential. Sometimes physically by removing the heritage, the landscape and the wildlife that underpins future long-term sustainable tourism. And this is how much of our countryside looks. This is actually North Yorkshire, and it's an area that was quite clearly a wetland at one point historically, and is now intensive agriculture because we all want cheap food. We demand cheap food. So this is what we get. It's hemorrhaging carbon into the atmosphere, exacerbating climate change. It's causing water to run off when there's an extreme weather event, a storm and causing catastrophic flooding further downstream uh, and in low-lying areas. The biodiversity is gone, and we're in the middle of a biodiversity extinction crisis. And this is part of the reason why. And the other thing with that, when I look at that image, is that has also hugely compromised any potential for future long-term economic sustainability and diversification through those drivers of sport, leisure, recreation, and tourism. Thank you very much.